I'm going to share my screen and I think I have to do a second screen share. Okay, so again, working off of my markdown files, which I like. Um, chapter 15 is called factors. And in R, factors are used to work with categorical variables. So variables that have a fixed and known set of possible values. Like for me, it's typically, you know, like control and then versus several experimental groups. Those are all leveled. Um, they are also useful when you want to display character vectors in non-alphabetical order, right? And now let me just switch to the learning objectives that John wrote for today. So let me see where those are. Here we go. Okay. Oh, and there it is. Good. So we're going to learn how to create uh, factor variables. And then we're um, using this general social survey dat data set to explore um how to do various things with factors with this four cats um package of functions and then the functions that we'll be learning is um how do you pronounce this four cats or four categories or that's just fine um, i just say four cats four cats and then this is also for four cats reorder right okay yeah or so or, then, or just factor a lot of times because oh the, yeah okay. four cats factor reorder factor relevel would be how i normally say them okay perfect <laughs> um so we'll learn how to reorder relevel and then there's a second type of reordering increase in frequency and then i think this is reverse and then um to modify factor levels uh how to recode them collapse and then lock okay so i'm switching back to the markdown is that what is selected for you guys now uh, we still see the notes. Okay, so let me redo the share. Okay, is that good? Yes. Okay, perfect. So we're going to be using, again, this 4Cats package, right, from the core tidyverse. And uh, a useful mnemonic that actually I found very cute. Um, I always have trouble remembering package names and things. So it provides tools for dealing with categorical variables. And it's also an anagram of factors, which is fantastic. Okay, so I've loaded up the tidyverse and to create factors, right? Um, so think if you had a variable, for example, that records months, right? December, April, January, March, you're calling that X1. Um, why isn't it displaying? It's putting it down here. Okay, and then using a string, right, to record this variable has two problems. So there are 12 possible months and you could easily make a typo like that. Um, um, and it also doesn't sort in any sort of useful way, right? So April, December, like to us, that's all scrambled up. Um, so you can fix both of these problems with a factor. And to create a factor, you must start by creating a list of the valid levels of the factor. So in this case, month levels concatenate, and then you put in all of the values for them. And then now you can create a factor. Um, and then you can actually sort this by factor. And if I'm not mistaken, this is usually in the order in which you created your levels. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. If, if when you when you specify levels. Got it. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes, that makes sense. So any values that are not in the set will be silently converted to NAs. Right. So where is your NA? December, April, NA, March. Um, and then if you want a warning, then you can also use reader uh, colon colon uh, function parse factor so that it'll let you know that there is um, something expected that is not showing up, right? So if you omit the levels, they'll be taken from the data in alphabetical order. This was actually very useful for me because that's exactly how I've been dealing with factors. I just have a data frame and then I'll tell it, you know, create factors from this character column. And it's useful to know that that's actually how it's done, that that's just the default order. Um, so if you want specific order, you can just create them given, you know, creating the levels and or we'll, we'll learn how to relevel later. 
Um, okay, so sometimes you prefer that the order of the levels match the order of the first appearance in the data, right? So you can do that when creating the factor by setting levels to unique or after the fact with this function in order. So, yeah, so there they match and uh, you can do this, you know, you have your, your data, you make them factors and then you can order them. Um, to access the levels, you can just do it with levels and data and it'll let you know. Okay. So then uh, this is the general social survey, and this is what we're going to be using for the rest of this small lesson. So it's actually a sample of data from the general social survey, which is a long running US survey conducted by the independent research organization NORC at the University of Chicago. And it's just a whole bunch of different types of data, right? Like uh, income, TV hours, religion, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so we're just um, using this small, handful that uh, Hadley has selected so that we can play with the factors. So let's just take a look. So you have year, then, you know, marital status, age, race, uh, reported income, party ID, religion, denomination, and then TV hours. So remember that if you want more information on a package, you can always just type question mark and then the GSS cat to get what you know these columns and other things mean. Um, okay, so when factors are stored in a table, you can't see their levels so easily, right? Unless you have very, very few rows. So one way to see them is with count. So we're just gonna take GSS and then um, and then pass it to count, and then we're counting by race. So now you have a, a nice summary of the race categories and then the count for each one or we can also do this via a bar chart so it's very easy to see the levels here um, so by default ggplot will drop levels that don't have any values right but you can force them to display with this uh, scale x discrete drop false and not applicable shows here so a question was, what does the scale X discrete do again? Sorry, I was muted. No, no problem. Um, <laughs> so uh, it, it helps, or it's how you specify what you want the X axis um, labels to be. So you're oh, saying okay. the scale for the X axis is discrete, means that it's, it's not continuous, it's set values. And um, so normally it's basically automatically applied with drop equals true. So you, you add it to specify that you want drop equals false. Got it. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, so these levels represent valid values that simply did not occur in this data set, right? And uh, dplyr count, you can set the drop option to false to show these. So let us see. Um, again, it's just showing this not applicable. That is actually a zero. Okay, so when working with factors, the two most common operations are changing the order of the levels and also changing the values of the levels, right? And uh, we'll see how these work in the operations below. So first let's modify the factor order. Um, so it's often useful to change the order of the factor levels when you're visualizing uh, your data. So for example, like imagine that you want to explore the average number of hours spent watching TV per day across religions. So let me just run this and then I have a, a couple questions on, on this code. So now you have TV hours here on the X axis and then all of the religions uh, but there is no pattern here. So it's very difficult to see like, you know, who watches more unless you're just like scanning all over the place. Um, okay, I think I understood why you needed age here. It's because he's using this same code for different types of plots. And at some point you will need uh, age. And then um, just this N equals N parentheses means that a variable named N will be assigned the number of rows. So the number of observations in the summarized data. So that was just helpful for me. Um, yep. 
then, um, okay, so because there's no pattern and it's difficult to see, uh, we can improve this, right, by reordering the levels of religion using this function reorder. So uh, it takes three arguments, F, the factor that you want to modify the levels of, and then a numeric vector that you want to use to reorder the levels. Um, what is this? Optionally, find a function that's used if there are multiple values of x for each value of f. The default is median. Okay. Does that make sense? Numeric vector that you want to use multiple values of x. No. So wait. <laughs> let me let me think about that. Um, so reordering by x. Okay. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. So let's say, um, so you're ordering by X. Um, let's say that uh, no answer had your uh, had. Um, we're going to order by religion. So yes. the no answer, or sorry, we're going to reorder by TV hours. So mm -hmm. let's, let's say um, the no answer entry had just two entries for TV hours. One was one and one was two. Mm -hmm. Let's go with three entries, so one, two, and four. Um, by default, it uses the median, so it would order as if that value were two. It would choose the two as the way that it's going to order no answer. But you could give it some other function. Maybe you want to use the mean. Maybe you want to just use the first value that appears for that one. Whatever might make sense in your situation. And so that's where that optional argument comes in. 99% of the time, just saying, take the median of, of that, that'll be fine. But um, especially I could see, you know, if you're working with means, then mm -hmm. you might want to give it the mean to sort by, because if you're, it, you know, it's going to sort by median, and then you're, you know, it won't be quite exactly the same order that you were going for in some cases. Um, and so that's where yeah, yeah. Okay. Set that in. Okay, that, that makes sense. Thank you, John. You're welcome. Okay, so now we're actually going to do this reordering uh, religion by TV hours um, in decreasing order. So now that is much, much easier to read, right? Pattern's very straightforward. Okay, so you can tell from this graph, right, that the people that in the don't know category watch much more TV, and then some of these Eastern religions watch much less TV. Okay. Um, okay, and this is a question that I had. So can you just sort your data frame by TV hours and then, you know, pass it onto this ordered religion variable and then just redo like the plotting without having to reorder the factors? Does that even make sense? It makes sense. Uh, have you run this? I did. Yeah, it didn't work. <laughs> because it's still yeah. doing the x-axis by default. It just uh, not alphabetizes. It just uh, I thought it was going to be alphabetized. It's it's the order that the um, that the factor is in. So when the factor was assigned, it was the order that that, that was in. Okay. At the time it was assigned, um, and so you need to tell it, no, no, no. I don't want that random order that it was assigned in originally. I want it this specific order for this case. Got it, yeah. Yeah, that, that was interesting to me because I've, I've been working on some things with levels and I was like, oh, okay. So yeah, it's it's not just a matter of, you know, sorting the data frame and because it's it's gonna take that original order, so, okay. Yeah, um, there is a, uh, th this is a very famous issue. Like um, I'm trying to find, there is, you don't have to type much of a search in Google for mm -hmm. like reorder factors. You like, you know, reorder, uh, yeah. Reorder at fa gets reorder factor levels R, at least for me, because it's such a th common thing that people are trying to sort out. Um, so this is a good one to learn. It comes up all the time. And again, it's a good one to remember that there is a solution in, the, in R for DS, and then you can go search for it <laughs> when you actually want to do it. You don't necessarily have to remember. Yeah. Um, but that's the the nice thing about four cats is, um, you know, it's relative. You know, I want to reorder the levels. What's the name of the function? It's reorder. So yeah, you know, yeah. it's pretty straightforward. Yeah. 
Okay, this this was actually super important for me and my work. Um, okay, and then it says, you know, as you start making more complicated transformations, Hadley recommends moving it out of the aesthetics, right, and into a separate mutate step. Um, so, for example, you could rewrite the plot above as you create this new um, mutated religion that's reordered, right, by what, whatever it is that you want. And then it's not within the aesthetic layer as, as we had it here. Um, so is this just sort of like good practice overall so that you're not, I'm guessing it's so that you can better track what it is that your aesthetic layer is referring to or? Yeah, so okay. it, it, normally I like to separate out all the like data transformations and all that okay. before the plot. Because that way you can take that same code and maybe, you know, instead of plotting it, you want to just look at, um, you know, do something else with it. Use it for modeling, use it okay. for whatever. And it's the same thing, like it's already done. Mm -hmm. um, and also putting it in the a AES kind of, well, number one, it hides it. And number two, if we look at, um, can you scroll up a little bit? Uh, mm -hmm. Oh, we aren't showing the scale. But when we have a scale on these, um, mm -hmm. the name of that, uh, without the mutate, but the name of that column is like factor reorder religion by TV hours. You know, it's, oh yeah, yeah. So, so this one, yeah. Or yeah, right there on the, on the left. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so oh, by doing the mutate, yeah. you take care of that. Like you can also just give it a name in the AES, but it's mm -hmm. easier to actually do it in a mutate. Um, okay. Well, it's nice to know that you can do it within and also sort of, you know, um, what best practices are, um, which then just made me go back to the all of the ggplot and look at the aesthetics and what those mean again. Okay, so now we can create a similar plot looking at how average age varies across the reported income level, right? So... What did we do? Okay, so we also reordered income here, but now it's in an order that just does not make any sense, right? It's all over the place. Right. And uh, it's because this is an arbitrary reordering of something that already had some kind of internal consistency for, you know, those categories. And so um, just reserve this function reorder for factors whose levels were arbitrarily ordered to begin with. Um, but it does make sense to pull this not applicable, that's all the way up here, right? To the front with all of these other like special levels, like refuse, don't know, don't answer. Um, and so you can use function or factor relevel for this. Uh, it takes a factor F and then any other number of levels that you want to move to the front of the line. So let's look at it without the relevel like this and then with the re-level. So now not applicable and all of these no answer, don't know, refused are at the very bottom. Um, so this was an interesting question. What do you think the average age for not applicable is so high? Um, anyone have any ideas? Well, this is income, right? Yes. Yeah, and so it's retirees are in the not applicable category. And therefore, because they don't have an income per se. And so that, I think that's what's going on there. Uh, got it, got it. Okay, I see. That makes sense, yeah. Okay, so now let's go on to uh, factor reorder two. So another type of reordering that is useful is when you are coloring the lines of a plot, right? So this fun, uh, factor reorder two reorders the factor by the Y values associated with the largest X values. So... This will make the plot easier to read because the line colors line up with the legend. Okay, so again, I'm, I'll run this and then I have some questions. Um, so for example, right here, you have no answer at the top, never married. So like say that you were looking at this age a year of, you'd have to really like look at the colors and then look over here on the legend and trying to match it. Whereas here, it's much easier. So at the largest value of X, which is 80, now you have everything in order from widowed, married, 
divorced, never married, etc. So it makes it a lot clearer. Okay, so I had some questions on to as to how you know this is constructed. So I get this filter, you're removing any NAs from age, right? And then the count here is the groups consisting of age plus marital status, right? So for example, like 18 year olds never married, 18 year olds married, 18 year olds divorced or something like that. And so that count goes into N. And then, so the proportion here is by age group. So for example, like proportion that never married at age 18 was 89 out of 91. And then this sum of N is over all Ns for a specific age group. And so I'm wondering if that comes because you're giving it this group by age prior to. So like, let me just run this, sorry. Okay, so here we have, you know, the age and marital categories, right? And then this is the count for each of these categories. And then this sum of N, right, right here, what it's doing is it's taking like, all of these 18, so this full count, sorry, these two, right? And then taking the proportion of that. And so I'm like, how does it know that the sum of N is only for the 18, 19, 20 age group, right? And I'm guessing it's because you're giving it this group by age? Exactly, okay. yes. Okay. So yeah, once you are grouped, it... it it's as if that group is its own data frame. So when you do a mutate, mm. it's only thinking within that group. Got it. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. That was interesting to me. All right. So finally, for bar plots, you can use this function uh, factor increasing frequency to order levels and increasing frequency. So this is the simplest type of reordering because it doesn't need any extra variables, right? And then you can also combine this with factory reverse, which reverses the order of the factor levels. So let's try without the reverse. It looks like this. Uh, that's not bad, you know, but this I think looks does look nicer. Um, all right. So now on to modifying factor levels. Let me check time, we're doing good. Um, so more powerful than changing the orders of the levels, it's changing the values of the levels, right? So this allows you to clarify labels for like publications, right? And collapse levels for high level displays. Because sometimes you have just way too much things and it'd be nicer to have fewer categories to look at. And so the most general and powerful tool is this uh, factor recode. And you can allow, um, allows you to recode or change the value of each level. So let's just take this GSS cat and the column party ID. And you can see like, you know, they have no answer, don't know, strong Republican, not strong Republican. So it's just like a, a bunch of things that are somewhat unclear and um, not as easy to understand quickly. Um, so let's tweak them, right? So that it's a little bit easier to understand. So what you're doing here is you're, uh, mutating party ID, and then you're recoding the party ID with the, generally this is the new and then uh, the old. So Republican strong, Republican weak, independent near Republican. That means, you know, a little bit, it's clear, I think. Hopefully you guys agree. Um, and then also this factor recode will leave levels that aren't explicit, explicitly mentioned as is, right? And also will warn you if you accidentally refer to a level that doesn't exist, okay? So then you can also combine groups, right? You can assign multiple old levels to the same new level. Um, so for example, in this case, you're assigning no answer, don't know, and other party to this new level, just other. Um, Um, so just a little word of warning, just use this technique with care, because if you group together categories that are truly different, you will end up with misleading results. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And then um, also, if you want to collapse a lot of levels, you can use this factor collapse, which is a useful variant of uh, factor recode. So for each new variable, you can provide a vector of old levels, right? So now, um, your mutating party ID again using this uh, factor collapse party ID. So now you say other is equal to all of these, uh, and then you know Republican 
all of these get collapsed, independent and Democrat. So this is what it looks like, okay? And then um, sometimes you just want to lump together all the small groups that make a plot or table simpler. And this is the job of the function aptly named factor lump. So, um, so this is a family of functions and then you have specific types of lumpings that you can do. So factor lump, low frequency, for example, is a simple starting point that progressively lumps the smallest group categories into other, right? Always keeping other as the smallest category. Okay, so this is, let's just see how it works. And then I had questions on this. So it's lumped, uh, Protestant was the main, you know, biggest response group or category. And then everything else went into other and then Protestant is still larger, a larger category than other. So. My question is, so how does this work exactly? And what is meant by progressively lumps? Like, what is this progressively? Like, how does it know when to stop? Yeah, he should have used an example yeah. that ended with more than two left. Because the yeah. idea is you keep yeah. adding a category in uh -huh. as long as other is still smaller than the category above it. Okay. So when it lumped, I don't know, Catholic in or whatever is right above, like, it was still... Other plus Catholic was still smaller than Protestant, so it lumped Catholic in. But if oh, okay. if, uh, okay. if other plus Catholic had been larger than Protestant, then it wouldn't lump it in. Or it. I, I think that's the one I, um, that is right before Protestant. I can't remember for sure, but whatever. I, I think so. <laughs> so, but yeah, that's what it means: is that it, it just it keeps trying to see can it lump one more in and still be smaller than the next highest category? If so, it'll lump it in to okay. other. Okay. Yeah, I, I figured that that's what was happening, but I wasn't super clear that that was. <laughs> yeah, it's funny to me that, you know, like he does a really good job of choosing data sets that are relevant to what you're looking at, whatever. But then he'll do an example like this that doesn't show what it does. Like, you know, show us another category within the data set. There's probably another one that you could lump together that would come out with three or four left. Um, right. Like, I'll bet if you did... If just fun fact lump low freak instead of relig do uh whatever we were just doing the party party ID. Um yeah. And then also count party ID. And I I'm guessing that one doesn't have a dominant one. So yeah. let's see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. So but other it actually it worked like the thing above that it lumped all the others. Uh, you know the the ones that aren't Republican and Independent or Democrat, it lumped those together. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because that five forty eight is still smaller than uh, Independent near Republican, but if you see if we add five forty eight to seventeen ninety one, that would be higher than strong Republican, so it stopped before doing that. Okay, wait, wait, wait. So. I mean, the, okay. the one above, he specifically lumped other categories together as well. But this one, you know, we can look at just other is 548. The next smallest is ind, comma, near rep, 1791. 1791 plus 548 is going to be 2330 something. So it's a it would be a little bit bigger than strong Republican. So it didn't do that final lump. Mm, got it. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Great, thank you so much, John. Um, You're welcome. Well, I I guess he did point out that in his in this example is not very helpful, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> the truth that the majority of Americans in the survey is Protestant, but we'd probably like to see some more detail. Yes. Um, so you can also use this factor lump n, right, to specify that we want a, a precise number of groups. So ten in this case. So there's the ten. Um, see if I had any questions. So I did, okay. So this print n equals infinite. So I looked this up and it says, um, these stand for infinity, negative or positive infinity, right? And it says, it says it's a result of storing either a large number or a product that is a result of a division by zero. Um, infinite also tells you that the value is not missing a number. So why are we printing 
So this n equals inf. Select just through count, like don't do the print n equals inf, and you can see what, no, up. Oop. Sorry. Control Z. Like that? Uh, no, I want to still include the count. So un the uncomment count. the count okay. and get rid of the pipe. So put a, a hashtag before the pipe. Otherwise, it'll break. Yeah, OK. There you go. And run just that. And you'll see, probably, did you, did you run it? I did. OK. Um, <laughs> it wasn't necessary here. Okay. So. Uh, either you have a setting or it's just because there are only 10, but it normally mm -hmm. a tibble only shows, actually tibbles always show the first 10 rows. So, right. So, okay. Now change N to Five? Um, 11 or 11. Okay. And run it again. Uh, and it's showing one through 10 of 11 rows. Mm -hmm. Whereas now if you uncomment everything, so funny that he used like this example again and then run that and it should show them all why is it not showing? Oh, oh it is it's um well, yeah why doesn't it it does it put it on a second page oh okay i think it didn't have that second page before um okay it, it's it didn't? it's different it's different in an RMD versus in the console. I think the RMD includes the whole table, the whole, whole table. Oh, no, you're yeah, right. No, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're correct. Yes. Yeah. So that's why. It's because oh. normally when you print it, it a table cuts it off so it doesn't just scroll forever. Yeah. It makes a lot more sense when there's more than 11, you know, when there are a <laughs> thousand rows. <laughs> yeah. it, also, yeah. You also changed N back to 10. I think it was oh. showing one through 11. Oh, 11 no, I did. But one. I just wanted to see what the original thing did and if it yeah. show everything or not. So, yeah. So yeah, now it's so. two pages. It, so it does show it in, uh, in an RMD, but if it were in the console, it, it cuts off at 10. Yeah. A tibble. So, so that's, that's what the print is for. It's for when you're copying the code and running in your console to like follow along. Um, oh, okay. 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 That makes sense. Great. Thank you. So You're let's welcome. see. Uh, we still have 18 minutes. So <laughs> let's go over some of the exercises then. So remember, there were some suspiciously high numbers in TV hours. So let's see. Uh, where I get this. And the question is, is the mean a good summary? So yeah, there's very suspiciously high number of TV hours because I'm like, how can you watch 24 hours of TV? <laughs> I think this is in a day. So... So that's either hours per day watching TV. Yeah. That must just be a wrong data entry or something reported a, a wrong number or something or whatnot. Um, but in this case, so the mean, um, you can say, you know, summary just cat and then TV hours and it will give you this. So minimum, first quartile, the median, the mean. They're not super different, right? Uh, the average is pulled higher because of these outliers. Right. Um, so, you know, yeah, possibly the median is a much better representation, but it's like an hour off. So. Yeah, but that is, it is a good example. When we were looking at the by age group or by religion, it tended, you know, it was like one to four were the means that we were looking at. Mm -hmm. so being off by an hour can be a pretty big deal. If, That's you true. Know. That's true. And just in general, like, my personal rule of thumb is if it's time, you probably mm -hmm. want a median because if you've got an average of one minute, but one person takes three years, then that person <laughs> throws everything off completely yeah. and it's meaningless yeah, versus yeah, median, yeah. you know, median. And there are a lot of other things that are that way too. But um, yes. this one, at least it has a limit of 24. Like if mm -hmm. there had been ones that were higher than 24, you would definitely want to do median, I think, or actually you would just want to eliminate those because they're bad yeah, data. Yeah, because that's nonsensical. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, but yeah, when in some cases, you know, you could have one person who says they watch 300 hours of TV per day. And if they are in some group, that's going to, or, you know, these two or three people or like, maybe dozen people who said 24 hours, whatever group they're in is getting artificially high. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Um, because again, probably not real. Like I, or, or maybe it's some sort of automatic, automatic monitoring device was on their TV and they just left Mm -hmm. their TV on something like Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah. (laughs) Yeah. But I think that that's, that's an important point in terms of like what you're saying about time you know variables and also like um sometimes a small difference like in this case i shouldn't have just said you know an hour is just you know right difference because it could be a significant uh difference depending on what the data means so yeah because if you look at the at the histogram you know it only goes Mm -hmm. to you know like eight is the main block of data so being off by an hour within eight hours and really it's you know six is the main the main chunk that you're going to be looking yeah. at probably. Yeah. So yeah. being off by an hour is a pretty big deal in this case. So. Yes, that yeah. makes a lot of sense. Okay. Um, so just recall this, why did moving not applicable to the front of the levels, right? Move it to the bottom of the plot. So remember this. So the not applicable was somewhere up here and now it's put it down here. Um, and this is using, you know, this factor relevel um, our income. So it says it's because it gives not applicable an integer value of one. And so again, this has to do with, let's see, so we re-leveled. So just imagine- How does this work, John? So is it- Imagine if the levels were one through 10. Okay. Like one would be at the bottom and 10 would be at the top. It's just because, you know, first means lowest in in mm. this you know in a plot and so since it's first it's the lowest one it's at the bottom right oh, okay okay and this just has to do with the i guess original ordering and so i guess what i'm what i'm wondering is the original ordering is always associated with some integer value for each of the, of the factor yes okay. so a factor um as far as our con- is concerned a factor is really an integer and it's an integer that has a label of text. Okay. So okay. internally, that's how it thinks of it. Okay. Um, so not applicable for every, like if you add one to not applicable, mm-hmm. you get two in this case, like, or, or you get probably no answer. Um, that kind of thing you normally don't want to do. And I think you might error because it's not really let's an see. integer, but it's so integer like. Yeah. If you do our income or yeah. It's, uh, um, oh, income. And then... I, I would do uh, bracket, bracket one to just get the first one. And let's okay. see what that is. Let's just run and see what that is. Nope. Is 8,000 to 9999. And now do right. plus one. I'm, I'm not sure if this will work or not. Let's find out. Okay, it's NA. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Plus isn't meaningful for factors, but in some cases, like some operations will treat it like a number. Right. Um, Arithmetic doesn't, but other things uh, will. And because under the hood, they're kind of a number. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Okay. That's great. Thank you so much. Um, You're welcome. Okay, so how how the how have the proportions of people identifying as Democrat, Republican, Independent changed over time? So we just needed to combine multiple levels into those three things, right? Um, These are the levels and we're doing a mutate party ID. Now we're collapsing uh, by party ID into these three categories and then running a count, which is again by year plus party ID, grouping by year. And then, so this is the same idea as a proportion um, as before and then just plotting it. And we also want to reorder so that uh, you have the Y values associated with the largest X values. So like this. And then again, the legend will match the the dots here on the largest year in this case. Um, So how have the proportions changed? Uh, I would say it stayed pretty similar over the years. Maybe independents have increased and Republicans but it's been have going, gone down a little bit. Yeah, it's been going up and down. Yeah. It's not as much of a change as I would have expected to see. Where does this end? Like 2017, mm-hmm. I think? 
very curious. Whether, yeah, 2015, you know. I think. Okay. Or a little um, earlier than that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Before 20. Yeah, I, I would be really curious to see the updated version of this data set if it, yeah. if if the answer to that question changes. Um, I didn't think so. Revenues what, increased and then went down, but yeah. Okay. Anyway, so it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, and then this is a, a very similar thing. So, how do you collapse this uh, reported income into a small set of categories, right? So, these are all of the levels of reported income, and um, in this case, uh, we want to just make smaller groupings. So um, for unknown, you're putting these into them and then this is uh, less than 5,000. So this is uh, back to Ryan's uh, lesson from the other week. So this is stringer C and it joins two or more vector elements wise, vectors element wise into a single character vector optionally inserting a separator between the input vectors. So I'm guessing it's looking for, for this category, less than 5,000, anything that is below that. Um, but it's also looking for, oh, okay, yeah. So this is just like- Yeah, it's just creating dollar those. sign and then yeah. finding, got it. So you're using that string, <laughs> string C, string collapse to make all those categories. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Okay, that does make sense. So instead of having to type them all in, that's that's very very useful. <laughs> okay. Um, so now, yeah, you see the new categories. The rest have remained the same, and I that that was it. Those were the the lessons that um, or the examples that I I thought were worthwhile. Um, overall, like I I found this particularly useful for the things that I'm working on currently. <laughs> So, um, and also actually Ryan's the chapter last week, I was like, immediately after the lesson, I had to use one of the stringer functions. I'm like, yes, this is perfect. Um, okay, all right. So let's see, we've got a couple of things in chat before we, we wrap up that Ryan had an open-ended question for the team. Um, if factors are a built-in enumeration in categorical data, what if the data in review has a dictionary and the variable column of each record is entered as a numeral? Would a best practice be to use a join or mutate to enter the text instead of a numeral? So basically, if in your table you've got like one through five, which in some other table corresponds to yeah, names some or something, yep, yep. some actual, yeah. Um, Depends on what you're going to do with it, but to when you're exploring the data, I do think it's really useful to basically turn that integer into a factor. Yeah, of what the names are. So I was you, thinking the same yeah. way. the uh, The thought is so all of this is from IoT equipment, and so instead it's producing a numeral uh, as a you know value of whatever that is doing. Right? No GPS, GPS one, GPS two, and the the idea would be if I operate this data frame or this CSV file, JSON data, whatever the case is, if I manipulate it in R, it's gonna treat it as a numerical value and do a bunch of weird, crazy stats on it. <laughs> That's not what I wanna do. I wanna treat it as the definition of what that ICD tells me, uh, interface control document. So that variable actually has, you know, any number of, uh, of textual entry for it. So I think the best option would be you create your separate data frames of that definition and then join that or mutate that uh, with those numbers, right? Uh, yeah, I would, I, it depends how many you have. Um, you might wanna just specifically mutate that column to okay. be a factor and give it you know, specific levels and you know give it all that info Good. or um, or you can join and then drop the, uh, numeric column or keep the numeric column if you need it for some sure. other purpose. Um, like either one, it depends how much of a pain it would be to type. <laughs> like, uh, join. there's tens of thousands of them, that's why I would, so, yeah, yeah, I would join a very case. specific. Okay, the second question, John and, and team, what I was leading towards is the definition or the vocabulary term level. I, I, I'm not finding some very clear definition of what a level is, I believe. 
it's the sum or quantity of a given categorical value in a data set, correct? I, I no, would say it's the no. subdivision of a category. Yeah, it's okay. the yeah. It, it's like the possible value. Right. Of, so the levels are the possible values for that column. Possible um, values, yeah. Yeah. Which is, I think, a really useful way to think of it because that's when you want to use a factor is when there is a finite number of possible values. Like mm -hmm. you don't, you know, by default, uh, R until the until version four, R would tr treat all strings as factors when it imported like a CSV. Um, which is, you know, like for someone's name, that doesn't make sense. Like everyone has a semi unique mm -hmm. name. And could, you know, a name can be anything. And so treating it as a factor, each time you get a new name, you get a new possible, you know, a new value um, versus what state are you from? Like, mm -hmm. that's a factor because there are only certain possible values for that or, or months. You know, that's why um, actually those both of those examples are built into R. There's state.ab. Um, I, I mentioned earlier that there's month. Uh, month.ab and month.name just built into R because they are such common, um, commonly used values. Um, mm -hmm. And so things like that, that's where you want to do a factor where it, where it has specific possible values. Even like in Ryan's case, you know, you've got tens of thousands of values, but they are still, it can only be in this specific list of values. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's where they become useful, and then you know, mo mostly so that you can sort by them in some specified thing, um, so that you can validate data that maybe, you know, one of them has a value that's impossible, and you want to know that you want it to throw an error or that, um, you know, this says that it took place in um, October. And that's not possible. That's not a month. So I want to, you know, flag that as a bad value, something like that. Awesome. Does Thank R you. also have a, a way with dealing, for example, like variable sex, like male, female? Uh, I don't think so. Not right. built in. I mean, I'm sure there are packages for mm -hmm. um, sorting, you know, uh, for best practices, basically. Mm -hmm. Um. But I don't think, yeah, there's nothing built okay. in. Because, yeah, that is one where uh, the the coding of that has changed over time. Like how, how what you uh, enter into a form. So, yeah, um, yeah, 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 exactly. Okay. All right. Well, that's what I had. So, okay. So, next week, um, just to recap, because Ryan wasn't here yet, but next week we will do chapter 16 on dates and times. Um, I do have learning objectives already available for you, so you can start working on that. Um, and then we're going to take a three-week break for the holidays. And, oh, sorry about my dogs. <laughs> and then uh, on January 8th, we will reconvene to start the programming section. Actually... Sorry, I had a question for Federica. Federica, um, this is sort of off topic, but um, <laughs> you just started a new cohort of the Tidy Modeling, right? That's on Fridays at, is it 14 UTC? Yes. Okay. Um, I've just started. Uh, actually, uh, we, we still didn't even start the first chapter. So if okay, you okay. would like to join, uh, yes. I've done just a little introduction. Um, emphasizing the book and everything how is we useful and what we are going through uh reading the book so okay. yeah so we need to start with the first chapter next week <laughs> okay perfect i will be there thank you <laughs> all right uh, see everyone next week <laughs> bye <laughs>